wildlife tracks and sign, uh, but it was this apprenticeship program and that focus and some of the homework assignments and mentoring that went on between our weekend visits that really, uh, really sent me on this long tracking journey. And I was just uh, so grateful for, for the folks, this cohort of trackers that I got to spend time with. And it was the type of people who could, you know, stare at the tiny little marks on, uh, on what I think is a maple tree here in this picture and puzzle over what type of woodpecker might have made the little hole or whether it could be, you know, insect sign or other marks on the bark or maybe red squirrels tapping for, uh, for maple sap. And, uh, you know, getting to spend time with people like my friend Lee here who would not hesitate to demonstrate how a moose or a deer might scrape up the bark uh, of a, a small tree to access the cambium and feed on that cambium layer. So just really, really fun people to be engaging out in the landscape with. And so after, after that 2015-16 apprenticeship year, I started spending almost all my free time uh, looking for animal tracks. So these were otter tracks that I found on the shore of Lake Champlain in Burlington near my house. I was spending a ton of time setting up tracking cameras in my backwoods and then also working with the Burlington Parks Department to put them up in all the different natural areas around town and uh, getting images like that gray fox that you see up top. And then I was hosting a monthly tracking club. And actually, there's Glenn at one of our tracking outings. I know Glenn's on this call. And, uh, and just trying to get people out tracking as much as possible and sharing in the joy of, of being able to to look for animals. And obviously winter is a great time to do it, but it is something you can do at any time of year. Uh, like Sean mentioned, I also started teaching some tracking workshops. So here's me at North Branch. And uh, also collecting all of these wildlife records and applying them towards wildlife management and, uh, and how we tend to our natural areas. So I started this thing called the Burlington Mammal Tracking Project, which was actually um, an assignment that I started for my white pine tracking apprenticeship and ended up creating this website that you can visit now. And, and the project is maybe a little less active now that I'm not in the Burlington area, but it, uh, it lives on as an iNaturalist project. And you can contribute sightings of large mammals that you see in the Burlington area. And that's something that folks at Parks and Rec and Winooski Valley Parks District and other organizations are um, accessing to see where the wildlife is in town. So there's just a little sampling of some of the results on the screen. So I share all that um, really as a as sort of an introduction and uh, to explain that when my two tracking teachers in the in the White Pine program at the time, when Dan Gardoki on the left here and Dan Hanchi got in touch and said, you know, hey, we're going to celebrate 10 years of offering this apprenticeship program by inviting our former students to go on a tracking trip to South Africa. Um, you know, it took me all of about 10 seconds to jump on board, even though I was actually between work visas back in Canada at the time, didn't really have a job at the moment, didn't know how I was going to make it all work, but it just seemed like something that I couldn't say no to. And so uh, that's what got me, uh, you know, on this, uh, on this journey and, and gearing up uh, for this trip to South Africa in August of 2017. And there are some other folks involved in this trip, too, who, uh, who made it all the more exciting. So this is Kersey Lawrence on the ground here. She's a uh, I think explaining how to tell the difference between some really similar antelope tracks in this picture. She's got a diagram there on the ground to, uh, to help us distinguish. She was one of, I think, the, uh, she was a member of one of the very first cohorts of the tracking apprenticeship. And since then had um, gone on and is you know, currently uh, undertaking a PhD related to wildlife tracking and started an organization called Original Wisdom, which was helping bring groups of trackers uh, to South Africa where she'd made some connections and been doing some tracking work. And, uh, and so White Pine was able to, uh, to access her as a resource and partner with her in being able to offer this trip. And Kersey's partner, Lee Gutteridge here, is another key figure on a trip and, uh, and really the, the lead guide, I would say, of our expedition. He runs an organization called Nature Guide Training. Um, he's a native from South Africa and um, just an encyclopedia of, of knowledge on all aspects of the natural history of the area where we were visiting. And uh, in this case here, he's showing us this old tribal iron forge that I don't actually remember how many thousands of years old it was, but we were visiting this place and, and discussing the deep human history on the landscape where we were visiting, that, uh, you know, he could go into that same level of detail on insect track and sign or, you know, the birds and mammal tracks and, and just, you know, you name it. And, and Lee literally has written the books on the natural history of the area that we were visiting. So I actually was, um, you know, reading up on the bush belt. I've got my copy right here and, uh, and, you know, had that with me on the plane as I set off towards South Africa in August 2017. 
So really good people to be traveling with. I landed in Hoodsprite, which I reached by way of Johannesburg, and uh, ended up on the outskirts of Kruger National Park. And, and that northeastern corner of South Africa was really the area of, of focus for this trip, the greater Kruger. Kruger is a massive place. Uh, Sean mentioned that I guide in Yellowstone now, and uh, Kruger is about twice the size of Yellowstone, so uh, roughly 7,500 square miles. Um, I, I was just reading up some stats and saw that it's larger than 90 different countries around the world, and uh, it sits on the, the northeastern border of South Africa where it borders Mozambique, and there's another national park in Mozambique on the other side. As I uh, was approaching this area and landing, I, I got to do my first kind of tracking and scanning out of the landscape, even from the plane window, and you know, getting a sense of, of here where we can see some human roads and trails, but also some of the game trails were showing up. And I, I didn't spot any big animals myself from the plane, but I heard from some of the fellow travelers on this voyage that they were able to see their first zebras or giraffes actually right from the plane as we were landing in this larger area. So soon after landing at the airport, I uh, was whisked off into one of our safari vehicles and was on the way to the camp where I would spend about the first week of my two-week adventure. And that's a spot called the Ngala Camp, which is in the Balule Nature Reserve. And that's in the Greater Kruger. So I actually never went, as far as I know, um, within the boundaries of Kruger National Park itself. But the greater region uh, includes uh, a ton of nature reserves. I have no idea of the number, but it's a massive amount of land that is privately owned that opens onto Kruger and so allows for that free passage of all of the same animals, big and small, that you would find in Kruger itself. And, uh, and with the added advantages of um, being able to, to get on the ground and, and maybe even access different parts of the landscape or be out at night doing some spotlighting for wildlife at nighttime and night drives and getting to do some trailing and, and having more freedom in the activities that you can access on the ground there. So that's kind of a, a big long preamble to, uh, to kind of get you into this place and I'm going to be launching into a bunch of stories. Um, I do want to say that as I, I started to make this talk, it, I realized it was going to be impossible to share all of the wildlife that I saw or even to do a, an effective job of of sharing the ecology of you know, even a fraction of the wildlife species that I encountered. So uh, since this is a tracking talk, though, here are a few promises that I can make. And that's that, number one, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of animal tracks in the dirt or in the sand and silt. Number two, there's going to be lots of trackers hunched over looking at the dirt. And number three, there will be a lot of scat or dung, uh, as it was frequently called in South Africa. and. Uh, I kind of say that in a joking way, um, but, but really I think my main goal in this talk is, is wanting to kind of transport you back into that experience, transport myself back into that experience, and give a sense of what it felt like to be immersed in that landscape, in that uh, greater Kruger area for two weeks, and also um, you know, what, the, what the routines and what the feel of a wildlife tracking trip can be like, and uh, hopefully there'll be some exciting stories along the way. So some first impressions. First of all, it was just completely surreal. Um, it, yeah, it, it really didn't feel real at all. It felt like a total dream. And, and maybe it's because I was so sleep deprived after not sleeping at all in my red eye flight or flights. Um, but also just the, the pure magic of being on this one and a half hour you know, first drive into that first Ngala camp from the town of Food Sprite and seeing animals that I'd only seen in pictures or documentaries or maybe in zoos before. And so we, we actually saw 15 giraffe on our way in, just like noticing them in ones or twos going across the landscape. And I was just completely enthralled, and, and it hadn't really sunk in, though, at the same time that I was there yet. It was just such a wild experience. You can see this um, giraffe here is, is reaching, you know, straining to reach some vegetation, and when we could see as we were traveling through the landscape the browse line on the trees that marked basically what is the tallest height that a giraffe can reach to browse. Another thing or, or first impression was encountering animals just, you know, from the very first drive in that I'd never even heard of. So this is a Varose eagle owl, or it used to be called a giant eagle owl. And uh, this is a picture that my friend Matt took later in the trip of one of these owls because we saw several of them and look at those big feathery feet. But this owl was way out on the distance and I have this vivid, vivid image in my mind of 
looking out and just seeing this massive raptor walking with its big feathery feet along this big horizontal branch and then taking off into the air and just feeling um, so swept up in in just uh, the unknown and, and all the different species, you know, and the, the rich biodiversity that I was going to be able to encounter in my time there. And then we arrived into camp and it was, uh, it was actually getting towards sunset by the time everybody was arriving. So our, our first activity was to go on a little drive or one of our first activities and, and to head up and watch the sunset. And uh, this is my first impression of the group of trackers or some of the group of trackers that I was traveling with. And this is what I absolutely love about traveling with this kind of group. And maybe you've had that kind of experience. It might not be this one right here, but, but having that kind of experience of like being with your people or meeting your people. Um, you know, and in my case, it's the people who, if they go on a walk through the woods, usually end up, you know, off trail or going at such a slow crawling pace because they're stopped by all the tiny little amazing things that you encounter along the way. And so in this case, we were there to watch the sunset and to take in the landscape. But of course, half of our group is hunched over a set of tracks and uh, looking to get to recognize some of the first footprints of some of the wild animals that we were getting ready to meet over the course of that week. So that's how trackers watch the sunset. Here's a scene and, uh, you know, just a, a first impression and view of the camp, the Ingala camp that we were staying at. Uh, there was, um, it was this beautiful area um, near a river and here you can see the, the central fire area where a couple of people are seated. There was a um, cooking structure, like kitchen area, and it was screened off. You can see towards the top right there and that was to keep the vervet monkeys out because the vervet monkeys would come into camp and um, you know, there's potential for other wildlife, too, to try to, to access that food area. And then on the front left, you can see the hot water boiler. And that's where we could um, get some steaming hot water to fill up the shower. So it was kind of like a rainwater shower, except we filled up the water ourselves and uh, would hoist it up. And so we were, we were camping for that first week at Angala Camp, but I would say it was pretty luxurious by my camping standards. Um, you know, it, it felt like home, and we even had flush toilets and showers, so it was... It was a lovely spot to land. And uh, we were tent camping, although I would say, um, you know, with the utmost comfort, we had a single mattress or a couple of single mattresses in each of those tents. And so this was kind of the, the view that I would get as I came out of my tent in the morning and watched the sunrise coming up. Now, another first impression of this area or kind of, you know, first thing that it took a while to take in was just this idea of safety and some of the hazards in the area. You can see here, these are some elephants that are parading by just on the other side of the river beyond our camp. But the main reason that I wanted to share this image was because you can see the three electric lines uh, going through the stake in the middle there. And it was those wires that were keeping us safe when we were in camp at night from anything that might be roaming out and about. So, you know, the gate would be closed and, and that was our fence to keep the, the lions and leopards out. And there were many nights where I had really, really vivid dreams of lions and leopards because we could hear them calling. And, and the sounds would be so loud that sometimes it would sound like they were right there, even though they might be miles away. But then in other cases, we would get up in the morning and we would look out and there would be fresh leopard tracks right outside camp. Or, you know, there'd be fresh footage on one of the wildlife cameras that was set up just outside camp. So, you know, immediately we, we had this sense of just being completely immersed in this area. We had an opportunity uh, almost every day to go and sit next to the Oliphants River, which um, ran right by our camp there. So, you know, in this case, our, our camp is just to the left-hand side of the screen, like just out of the frame. And here's Amy taking in, taking in that scene. And I wanted to share this, though, just to, to reinforce or, or emphasize how wild it was to try to come to terms with some of the hazards of this area. So we were instructed on our first full day um, on the land there to go and choose a spot alongside the river and we were all going to spread out and, and you know be within a certain range so it would be safe and, and we all, we'd all be pretty clustered together but the very important directive was that we needed to be at least three meters away from the water and I was looking at the water thinking I don't know it looks pretty calm and and not too scary like you can see the sandy bottom in a lot of different spots here um, but there is very clear warning that there could be a crocodile lying in wait. And, uh, and crocodiles can reach seven meters length and a thousand kilos and, um, you know, are these massive top predators of these freshwater environments here in the build. And, uh, and so it just, it seemed, you know, almost impossible and yet uh, 
very, very real at the same time uh, that there could be one of these large crocodiles lying in wait. And so it was vitally important to not sit too close to the water. And uh, it's a funny thing, though, to, you know, have been sitting there and, um, and, you know, almost feeling tempted. Like, really? Like, do you really have to stay that far away? Now, we had good modeling from some of the other wildlife we saw approaching the water. And, uh, and crocodiles will learn the habits of wildlife. And, you know, they may find favorite drinking spots, um, favorite crossing points. And they can lie and wait for days, if not weeks, for that opportunity to come in touch with something like this male kudu here. And so uh, it was this kudu who served as a really good teacher and helped to reinforce to me just the utmost care that it takes to slowly approach the water and come in for a drink and just always keeping your head up. Another sip and then head up, another sip and then head up again. And then just moving those big ears around in all directions. There were some other good teachers of awareness out on the landscape, and I'm going to play a first video here, and, and I want to apologize if, uh, if the frame rate's kind of slow. I know the video is going to play really perfectly on my end, but, um, but by the time it gets up into Google's cloud and comes into your computers, it might look a little choppy. And, uh, and do know that if that ends up being the case, I'll get that feedback and make sure that I can post these videos online for you to see in their full non-choppy versions. But uh, I've also included in this presentation some stills that represent pretty much the content that's in each of the videos. But I uh, just wanted to introduce you to one of our other awareness teachers here. So here we are. You can see Matt and Kersey who are on the pathway that leads from our camp down towards the river. And uh, somebody noticed this little shape way off in the distance and looking through binoculars and then zooming in with my camera, we saw that there was this giraffe who was just... I know, kind of creeping on us, checking us out from way out across the river. And it, it became a bit of an awareness game over the course of the trip to, to figure out what was noticing us and, and, you know, where was the nearest giraffe, because quite frequently you could spot one somewhere on the landscape. Some of them were good at playing hide-and-seek, like this one here that we could see from our camp, just like head buried in a tree, um, not quite fully in view for us. So there's some first impressions of the place. Now, how about this tracking substrate or tracking conditions we were encountering here? Um, this was such a dream destination in the Valley Nature Reserve because there was this really fine silt uh, all across the floodplain where we were camped out. And it just made for absolutely incredible detail that we could see in all of the wildlife tracks that we encountered. And uh, in this case here, you may notice in the middle of this image, there's some fine lines that Mike is going to point to there that, uh, that look kind of like fur. And this is, in fact, a spot where a scrub hare had, uh, had laid down in the road and had done a bit of dust bathing. And so you can see some of the tracks. And, and in this image here, I think I can even see the face print uh, of, of the animal right there. This is an animal I don't think I ever saw, but we encountered their tracks uh, all throughout our trip, or at least throughout the first week of the trip. Here's a spotted hyena track that we found on our first full day, and this hyena was moving at full tilt across one of the, uh, the roads in the nature reserve, and it looked like it was chasing after an impala, because there was an impala trail, which is a type of antelope, also in full flight. And what I love about this image is you can see the spray uh, of some of that sediment that's that's come up and you can just or I can feel the motion of that hyena in the track um, The pencil is in there as a, as a scale item any any good tracker or experienced tracker knows that you should include a scale item Ideally a ruler in your images. So you'll see some kind of creative ones in some of my pictures um, but uh, Yeah, just awesome to be able to spot this trail and I think this is the first hyena sign that I saw these are baboon tracks here, and uh, if you take a look, you can actually see some of the, um, the fingerprints or, um, you know, the patterning of the palm, the palm pads um, on this hind foot of the baboon, which is on the right-hand side there. And uh, it was just, you know, incredible to see. Like, I could have, you know, basically read this baboon's fortune and its palm lines if that was an art that I was practicing. So just incredible, incredible detail. Now, along with all those detailed tracks, uh, another big first impression was just 
there was so much scat on this landscape. Scat, poop, dung, whatever you want to call it, excrement, feces. Um, it was everywhere. And uh, we often joked actually over the first few days of the trip that it seemed like there is more scat, like there was more product of the feeding of animals on the ground than we could actually see vegetation anywhere. Now granted, we were there in the winter time, so it wasn't uh, the growing season. That The sight lines were great for that reason. It was the dry season. Um, animals that may congregate in big herds were in you know, smaller herd groups at the time. There just wasn't as much food available. Uh, so, you know, that could account for it. We were looking at scat that basically was sitting and, and drying out on the landscape for months. Um, you know, years even, but uh, but again, just so much of it in all different shapes and sizes. So this is the the awesome shape of zebra or zebra scat, as they pronounce it in South Africa. We could see different colors. So this is an example of some impala, the antelope scat, um, and there's this midden area because they'll all deposit these scats in in the same region in these big piles, and we could see a couple of different colors representing different ages of scat. And you'll notice here, I mean, this is our, our guide, Lee Gutteridge, holding these pellets in his hand. Um, but uh, believe it or not, I, I won't get into the story in detail, but we picked up a lot of scat on this trip, and I even got uh, convinced, or tricked, you could say, into uh, participating in a scat spitting contest and placing uh, a couple of these pellets in my mouth to see how far I could spit it across the ground. There was, like, a line to measure our progress. Um, but uh, I was assured that it was safe by our guides, and it was also um, so dry and so sun-bleached, it seemed like it must be completely sterile from having sat out there for so long. Or so I hope. I, I haven't heard any news of any uh, parasites that I'm carrying at this point anyway from having put one in my mouth. Um, there's, you know, big piles too. Like we were seeing a sign of elephant all over the place, even if we weren't seeing tons of elephants all the time, just leaving these massive piles from all the vegetation, plus the sign of all the, the trees that they were tearing up and, and gouging into. So elephant sign everywhere. And then, um, you know, again, here's like the mother of all scat piles from all my images from, uh, from Impala. And basically, if you saw a pile this big, out of all the antelope, you knew it had to be Impala because they were the only ones leaving these midden piles or um, clusterings of scat in these amounts. So that actually leads me right into my, my next of my first impressions of Africa or, or sort of lessons learned, and that's that there was this whole language of antelope to learn. So this is a picture of a male Impala here. And uh, I actually don't even have a count of the number of species that we encountered, uh, but, but there were several. And it was such a, a fun challenge to try to distinguish, uh, being able to, to read their tracks and signs compared to a spot like New England where we pretty much have white-tailed deer, or in some cases moose, um, or like where I'm in the West, I can add elk into the mix now. And, and it's funny because sometimes I puzzle over like a really big deer track versus a really small elk track. But in this case, there were like dozens of species. And then remember, too, that they all have babies as well. And so there was just so much overlap. And it was, um, I would say, a really fun puzzle as a tracker to try to, to distinguish all these different tracks. The Impala could leave some really distinct ones because sometimes, like you can see in the image on the right here, uh, just the, the outer edge of their toes would register. And so it was this fun um, yeah, outer impression that made it easy to tell from the others. We also had Inyala. This is, uh, um, so if Impala are a little bit smaller than a white-tailed deer, let's say, I would call Inyala a little bit larger um, by my memory. And we have a, a male Inyala on the left here and then a female on the right-hand side. Uh, they do have the, those vertical white stripes in common, but otherwise have a pretty different look to them. And uh, there's a track that you can see down there on the bottom. Um, and Yala mark this fun kind of medium size um, antelope distinction because the male in Yala is referred to as a buck, just like we would use for deer or elk. But the female is referred to as a ewe. So I think ram and ewe, like for sheep or goats. And so they're kind of in that in-between size. For antelope that are smaller, then in Inyala, they're referred to as ram and ewe. And then for antelopes that are bigger, they're referred to as buck and doe. So they marked the, uh, or sorry, buck and cow, I should say. Um, but in any case, they marked that transition point. Um, 
The Inyala is the uh, the antelope that we maybe got the most up close encounters with because there were a couple of really friendly Inyalas that would come into the safety of our camp. So I mentioned that we had this area that was protected by that electric fence and there was a gate that would close at the nighttime, but during the day it was just left open. So we would usually go out on some morning activities and then come back and we'd encounter Neville here who was uh, busily browsing on some of the vegetation right outside our tents. And so he made for a lot of good selfies and, and a lot of, good, a lot of good, uh, good close encounters, but was obviously very habituated to people and, and found safety in being nearby. But it was, it was fun to get to see one of these antelopes so close. Um, moving up in size here, we have water buck. And uh, these were uh, another of the shaggier um, medium to large size species. Like we're talking in the, I think they can be like 600 kilos or something like that, like fairly large size. Um, and they have this lovely white target around their rumps that made them really easy to distinguish. And, and if I recall correctly, um, I think there's a theory that that helps the young to potentially follow in line with, uh, with their mother or, you know, for the herd to follow each other. And they definitely made it uh, a lot easier to identify these antelope across the landscape. And of course, Here's an example of some water buck tracks, which are actually quite large for their body size. Uh, true to their name, water buck, they do spend a lot of time near the water. Uh, I think they need to drink more frequently than other animals and, or the other antelope, and we did see them in the water quite frequently. And then moving up in size, we actually already met uh, this, this antelope a little earlier in the talk, because I made mention of the male kudu coming towards the water as I was sitting by the river. And so this is a female on the left hand side. And uh, one thing that the male and female have in common here you may notice is that beautiful color of their ears. So the ears are just super rich in blood vessels for heat regulation. And they also act as these massive satellite dishes or receptors for gathering in so much sound. And so it was fun to watch their ears swivel in all directions. And then uh, I was kind of going to like bigger and bigger sizes of antelope there, but then we also had some really teeny tiny ones um, that we didn't encounter too much on the land, but we would see their, their teeny tiny tracks. These are tracks of a sharp scree spock, but the antelope that I'm showing here are a steenbok on the left, this diminutive thing, and then a clip springer on the right hand side. And you may notice that that clip springer is standing on a rock. And on other occasions across the landscape, we would sometimes notice these clip springer uh, silhouetted like way off in the distance. So they're another fun one to try to spot out on the landscape, um, but uh, tending towards those rockier habitats. So there's a lot of first impressions and uh, I wanna give you a sense of our daily routine on this tracking journey and, and some of the activities that, that we would take part in, basically how we filled our days. So, uh, so most mornings we would be up at sunrise and uh, head out on the land for some time, either on foot or in vehicles. And if we were headed out in vehicles, that usually meant splitting into two smaller groups because we were a group of 17 total. So we could split across these two safari vehicles. So there was always a bit of like a choose your own adventure because you never know which, never knew which direction each group was going to end up in and, and what activities they may undertake. It was usually just a, a blind guess or just, you know, go wherever you feel like it. And, uh, and we would head out early and basically spend a whole bunch of time on the land until we came back into camp for a breakfast or a brunch and then have some quiet time in camp and then head out for another activity time um, later in the afternoon and, and into the evening, sometimes going on night drives or often going on night drives and activities too. So, um, so within those activity blocks, there would be one or a combination of things happening, but often we'd go out with a particular intent in mind, and, and quite often it was track and sign investigation. And, you know, I've already been hinting or talking a lot about this, um, but basically, you know, crouching down, looking at the sign of animals, um, you know, in the dirt, looking for, for anything and everything. And to me, this is like the real kind of geek out activity. You can see that... Uh, you know, Amy here has this look of concentration on her face and Dan is taking a photo and we're looking at the tiny tracks on the screen of or some kind of insect, maybe a beetle coming across right here. Which, you know, I know is maybe not for everybody, but, uh, but super rewarding to be able to, uh, you know, engage in the study of this and pull out field guides and do some journaling and note taking and, um, and, you know, take on some practices that help to reinforce your understanding of what you're seeing. 
On the right-hand image here, you can see um, Bronwyn and Eric are uh, mixing up some plaster of Paris. It's like a thick or kind of thin milkshake consistency, and they're pouring that into some, some tracks. And so in that way, you can allow them to harden and then have these replicas of some of the tracks that you've seen. So that was another thing we engaged in. Sometimes we'd be headed to a place and, and suddenly this moment of track and sign investigation would just be upon us. And, uh, you know, in this case here, Rob, who's looking up towards the vehicle in this image, you know, it almost looks like there's car trouble or an emergency going on, or at least I can sense that in the, the body language in the image here. But we'd been driving along when he spotted, I actually don't even know what track it was. You know, it might have been like, oh, a, a track of an antelope that we hadn't encountered yet that he wanted to take a photo of for his, for his knowledge and for his study. And it was like, screech, put on the brakes, you know, everybody piling out of the vehicles. We're all like jumping into action. You can see like Rob here, uh, you know, reaching towards my friend Lee in the back vehicle, like grabbing either like a scale item, maybe a ruler to take a track photo or, um, or you know, a camera so that you can take a picture or something like that. So uh, it was it was amazing to be with this size group of people and, and you know, people who have so much curiosity for, for all aspects of the natural world. And, um, you know, there's such power in, in going out with people who uh, ask different questions and notice things that you wouldn't notice on your own in this landscape. And, and you know, that's no matter what their starting point in knowledge. Everybody was able to, uh, to be aware and notice and get curious about different things. So there's track and sign investigation. That's, that's a lot of the head down to the ground, you know, pouring over the details of tracks. But there's this other practice that definitely drew me in the most, and that was this idea of trailing. And, uh, and I guess I did call this, this talk on foot with lions and leopards. And that was very much my goal in, uh, I, I would say, like my big kind of underlying hope in wanting to go to South Africa was to have the experience of encountering some of these animals on the ground and, uh, and, you know, if not necessarily encountering, like, face-to-face, -face, at least getting to, to get on their trails and explore the landscape and learn how they access the landscape and see the landscape through the tracks that they leave behind. So this was definitely a much more head-up kind of process, and usually we would just have a couple of people working a trail and, uh, and an armed guard because of, of all the dangerous wildlife that was out there also working the area. And, and you know, unfortunate, or fortunately, it was never, um, you know, something that we had to access to have to, uh, to scare off any animals. And I don't think that Chris really have, have ever had to in the history that I'm aware of to shoot at an animal. Um, but there is a, as a last resort and a protection because we were in an area with, you know, elephants and Cape buffalo and lions and leopards and all else on the landscape. The lions and leopards we were a little less worried about in the daytime because they'd be tucked away sleeping for much of the day, but you just never knew what you were going to encounter. And uh, it was our first full day in South Africa at that camp that I got to get on my first lion trail. So these are the, the lion tracks from my title slide on the right there. And it was my very first experience getting to follow along. And I mentioned how amazing the tracking substrate was in this area, but there were a lot of locations where you could go from having perfect tracks to then nothing, um, or just, you know, completely obscured ones because the animal had stepped on a branch or, you know, some firmer ground or something like that. And so it was great practice for, for being able to stay on the trail and basically engage in, in all the, the tips and tricks of, of trailing to try to, you know, notice the farthest track that you can find and, and also try to get into the head of that animal and understand what would, they would be drawn to and, and where they would want to move on the land. In this case here, we, we got out and we're trailing a leopard, and you can see here's the, uh, the three lobes of the metatarsal pad of a leopard or the heel pad of a leopard, and then the splay of four toes with no claws. And, uh, you know, here's a case where one track was showing up, and then there would be this stretch of maybe even 100 yards where we wouldn't be able to find another track. And it was really interesting to look to the example of our guide, Lee, and just notice how long he might travel, just trying to intuit or guess at where that leopard may have moved. And that could be based on a knowledge of the animal, based on a knowledge of that, you know, like particular animal and how it uses that landscape, or just like noticing the different routes and, um, and where the ease of movement is. And so it was incredible to sometimes just head out on, on what felt like a guess or this one possible spoke of where the animal may have moved. And then after maybe five minutes of not finding any tracks, you would get that confirmation of finding the next leopard track in the trail. 
and uh, just uh, amazing to be out on the landscape knowing that those big animals were there. Sometimes getting on the trail just meant finding other discoveries too. And so there's definitely, you know, I think of, um, you know, track and sign investigation and trailing as kind of these two separate ways of engaging, but, uh, but really trailing can encompass all of it. And, you know, it involves that present moment awareness and, and ideally trying to approach an animal and see it without it noticing you and be able to safely move away from it. Um, but also just coming across all these discoveries. So this is um, an armored ground cricket, like part of its part of its body that we found on the ground, or like an exoskeleton piece. And just then, you know, this fun little thing that we noticed as we were poking around looking for tracks. This is uh, Amy on another leopard trail and giving that happy, we found a leopard trail face. And this is an example of one that we found right outside our camp. But I share this example because it also illustrates just the fun tension sometimes of being in a group of trackers and just having so many different things that you might want to look at. And so we had started following this leopard trail when um, we made our way into this little ravine, which is right next to our camp. And uh, suddenly with some leafy vegetation in front of his face, our guide Lee notices some insect sign uh, on, on one of the shrubs here. And I will completely admit that I have no idea what the insect sign was. Um, I'm not going to be able to share that with all of you, but it was one of those fantastic moments where we went from being as excited about a leopard trail um, to you know, as excited to see sign of, you know, what might have been a beetle or a leaf miner on this tree. And uh, you can see, though, in this video that I'll share that people definitely had different, um, different priorities in terms of what they were the most excited about. So some were enthralled as, uh, as we took a look and we're trying to get photos of this invertebrate sign. And then there were people like our guide Kersey over here it was like, okay, the leopard trail is over this way. Why aren't we on it still? And uh, I was definitely amongst a crew of people who were, who were kind of pushing and wanting to get uh, farther ahead on that trail and continue on the track. But, uh, but just such an incredible place to be with such a variety of sign. And everywhere you looked, you know, there was, um, there was something, you know, brand new to discover and uh, just this wealth of choices. Now, I will say, I, I don't want to talk too disparagingly about insect and invertebrate sign because it is this whole world, um, you know, to discover. And, and there's a, a great book, actually, on, uh, on insect and invertebrate tracking that, uh, that you can pick up. It's available from uh, Charlie Eisman here in North America. And, and Lee has written the equivalent, Lee Gutteridge, to that book in South Africa. So we were obviously with somebody who really knew his stuff. And so, you know, he was noticing things like this um, – this milkweed locust, this was at a, a later reserve that we visited, and, and this was the insect sign that totally won me over to, to paying attention or more attention to invertebrates. This was a case of a locust that had been infected with a fungus and given it something called a, what's called a summit disease. And it had basically given this locust the drive to climb up onto vegetation where it died, and then the fungus was able to reproduce and send out its spores from that elevated location so that it could better reproduce and, I guess, reach the next locust to then carry on its life cycle. And it was just totally amazing. You know, we were looking at this next to, like, a, a rhino trail or something like that, that, uh, that these little signs on the landscape could definitely suck you in as you were on the trail of these bigger animals. So we've talked about track and sign investigation, trailing, we also spent a lot of time on the ground going on wildlife viewing drives. And so that would usually be heading out in the vehicles just with the goal of, of trying to spot, you know, either in the daylight or with a flashlight at night and, uh, and look out across the bush belt. And we had access to what you can see in the image here we call the tracker seat. And that's the seat that sits right on the hood of the vehicle. And uh, if you've been on safari, it's often one of the, the local guides who may occupy that seat and even jump up to, to follow a lead of a hot trail or something that they may want to show you. But on this trip, we all got to take turns driving in this seat. So this image or this video clip shows what it was like to be able to sit in that spot and cruise along. And it definitely gave you a, a prime spot for, for wildlife viewing, but also actually almost more than anything, a, a chance to see some of the trails and the tracks that you might otherwise miss from having to peer over the edge of the car. So definitely best seat in the house. Now, um, this is an instance of, uh, or here's a little story that I'll tell you because we were out on a, 
a wildlife viewing drive one morning. I mean, we'd been, in, we'd been kind of geeking out over some track and sign and then decided to move on and go see what other wildlife was out there. And we ended up in this fork in the road. And this is on, I think, the second full day of the trip or maybe my third, you know, still pretty early on. And uh, we ended up having this choice because we saw distant wildlife in one direction, distant wildlife in another, and had to make the choice if we wanted to approach either zebras or elephants. Um, and, you know, I would have been pretty happy with either option because it was my first elephant sighting of the whole trip, and it was my first zebra sighting too. But we, uh, we got out of the vehicles, and we had this good vantage point to be able to approach a little ways. Like these elephants are still maybe 100 yards out, but we approached uh, into the wind, so we weren't sending any of our smell towards them to potentially spook them, and, uh, and got to take a few steps closer. And there is one big elephant you can see in the, on the right-hand side, but there is a baby elephant in this image as well. And there's the close-up right there. And I uh, had this feeling of, you know, thinking it might be dead, the way that it was curled up on the ground there. But we actually watched it get up and give a little scratch. And then these two elephants carried on and moved off towards where some others were. But it just so happened that the other elephants were behind us. And, and we were definitely worried that they might kind of come together and end up really close to us somewhere in the middle. So we were camped out there watching. And... Uh, this is actually my first experience on the ground with some of this wildlife. And so there's our guide, Lee, holding the rifle. And he says, all right, if the elephant starts coming, and what you're going to see probably is just branches flying up all through the air. And, you know, you've maybe got 30 seconds until it's on you, if that. So if the elephant comes, just turn around and walk calmly back to the vehicle, and you'll be fine there. And, uh, and I totally trusted, you know, from his experience that that could be true. And it also seemed completely terrifying that an elephant could start stampeding towards me. Uh, but, but the goal here, you know, was accomplished. You were able to watch without the elephant um, being wise to us and uh, got back in the vehicle. We were going to head back towards our camp at that point, but we looked on down the road and I spotted these two dark shapes distantly in the river, which turned out to be Cape Buffalo. And there's a cattle egret on the back of one of them here. And uh, this just led to one of those awesome kind of I don't know, ama amazing moments on the trip of just feeling so present and alive with all the wildlife that was out there. It's, um, you know, it feels almost greedy, the, the amount of wildlife sightings that you could have just in one setting there, in one scene. So we turned from seeing elephants to spot these Cape buffalo, and then this goliath heron lands in the water. This is a one and a half meter tall or over four foot tall heron. I think it's the largest in the world that lands in the water there. And then the buffalo moved off, these, uh, these two bachelor male buffalo, and I uh, you know, came up onto shore. And then we looked downstream to the right, and there were five hippos in the water. These are the first hippos I've ever seen. And we look upstream to the left, and there are some crocodiles on the shore, and they're gaping. They have their mouths open, which um, is thought to be for thermoregulation, although they also do it at, at nighttime too, so there could be a social signaling to it as well that these massive crocodiles are there and finally giving us some proof that we do have to be really, really careful at our sit spots. There are crocodiles in the area. And, uh, and then these birds started alarming in the, in the grasses kind of in front of um, that little island you can see in the river there in front of where the Cape Buffalo are. And our, our guide, Lee, says, oh, you know, I bet there's a monitor lizard there. And sure enough, a second later, we catch a glimpse of a monitor lizard and then um, these birds, the lapwings, also alarm at uh, an eagle that comes by. And it was just this wild moment of um, there just being so much to see. And uh, this was like three days into the trip, and I felt like I could have gone home happy, even though I hadn't seen a lion or a leopard or any of like those other, uh, other members of the Big Five that so many people go to that part of the world to see. But it was just, uh, yeah, pretty incredible to be out there on the land. But it wasn't all fun and games, because we were also being evaluated. And uh, I have to say that tracking evaluations are, are one of my absolute favorite things. They're a, um, there's a standard system and process that was actually born out of South Africa and then brought to North America that basically involves uh, an evaluator circling something on the ground and saying, you know, what foot of the animal made that or what animal made it or how was it moving or something like that. And uh, and you were left all to yourself to try to figure out the answers. And so we spent a lot of time, uh, we had both an official evaluation and got certificates uh, based on our level of tracking knowledge in South Africa at the end of this adventure. But we also had these practice rounds. And so in this case, guide Diana on the right-hand side there has basically circled a bunch of questions for us, and we were all engaging and trying to figure out on our own time 
what was what, who left that scat, who left that track. But it turns out that tracking evaluations in Africa have their unique set of challenges, I would say, because uh, maybe halfway through this parade of elephants came on into the area and uh, completely interrupted things. They actually started walking right up along the road where we'd been looking at track and sign. At this point uh, in the proceedings, we've gone back into our vehicle for safety. And it was something like a dozen elephants that came really, really close. And the thing about elephants is that they are so soft-footed. They were able to approach us, and they had probably gotten within, I don't know, 30 meters or 30 yards without us noticing at all. And part of that was, like, heads down on the ground, just so absorbed and trying to figure out track and sign. But they are also, are also just incredibly quiet movers. These are the big tracks that they leave on the ground. And you can see in this image, this is an elephant that was moving towards the left-hand side of the screen. And other animals, I think maybe jackal, have stepped into its tracks. Uh, but you can see the big hind foot uh, which is narrower and longer, and then the front foot on the right-hand side. And uh, we even got out listening with um, some microphones and some audio equipment to where some elephants were moving. And even with that added equipment and being able to listen out to a myriad of different bird calls that we weren't picking up on otherwise, the elephants moved so, so, so quietly. So just, you know, the most massive, um, in many respects, the most dangerous or, or to be you know, respected animals out there and just so quiet. Um, and another case, and, and this is a, a sad but very real note, we had another situation where we were taking a look at track and sign on the ground when suddenly helicopters, I think, were circling and we were hearing a lot of noise. And I'd actually woken up in the middle of the night before to helicopter noise from within the tent too, and I thought maybe I'd dreamed it. But it turned out that there were some uh, poachers suspected in the area and that was a very real part of the story. I mean, it is a very real part of the story in Africa that there is a market, um, you know, in various parts of the world, but China and Asia specifically for um, things like rhino horn, which actually don't have, you know, a medicinal value, but are, are thought to bestow all kinds of benefits. And so there is um, an anti-poaching effort going on in the area while we were there, and we ended up actually moving back to our camp and having to give up on this evaluation and, and this quizzing time because we wanted to make way for those efforts that were going on. And uh, it's, uh, it's gotten pretty extreme. Some of the, the conservation efforts or anti-poaching efforts now are um, leading to dehorning the rhinos. And, and I will say the rhino is just one example of an animal that's targeted, you know, lions, elephants, um, you know, smaller animals. Uh, many of them are, are being targeted by poachers. But in this case, um, or, you know, in this instance here, one effort that's going on in this nature reserve is that they're going in and within a very quick span of time, removing, without killing or hurting these animals, they're removing the horns from the male rhinos so that, uh, um, so that they don't, or so that they're not serving as an attraction to poachers, basically, right? So these rhinos are getting killed for their horns, but if they don't have the horns, then they're not going to, to need to be killed to be able to grab them. So... The idea is that the anti-poaching efforts are coming in. These conservationists are very quickly removing all the horns within a short span of time so that no rhino is kind of at a disadvantage because it is a, a dominance, um, you know, signal and, and something they use uh, between rhinos and then uh, letting them back loose on the landscape. So I didn't actually see any rhinos while I was on the reserve, um, but these efforts are ongoing and, and something that's being addressed. So on that kind of real um, note, we're going to say bye to the Angala Camp, which is the first reserve that I, that I visited on this trip. And I want to share just a couple of additional stories from some of the other locations. And the next one that we went to was Kokomoya Camp, which was on the Manuletti Game Reserve. And this was uh, a, a fairly short drive, you know, an hour or so from, well, I should say actually a couple hours because we were out on a, a long Bush Road, but basically over the course of our day, we, we made our way over towards this other camp. And this is a different kind of um, lodging experience compared to where we'd been tent camping. We were still in tents, but they were quite a bit larger, and there was this big central dining and meal area. And uh, there was a watering hole that you could see from it, which is right here, kind of framed between the trees and the image. And, and we would have dinners, and there would be a spotlight on the watering hole, and we could watch hyenas sipping water at night, or even watch a, we watched a honey badger go by one night, which is just wild. 
One thing it had in common with Angala Camp was that we were still visited by vervet monkeys, and this is one that I actually watched climb down to the bar area where I was sitting below, and he opened a fridge, he or she reached in, grabbed a stick of butter, unwrapped it or peeled it almost like a banana, and then proceeded to eat it. And it was just the, <laughs> the weirdest, funniest thing to watch. Um, these are the tents that we were sleeping in. So this was a, a tent for two people, uh, much bigger than, than the small ones with little mattresses inside. But the main reason I share this picture is that what was wild about this camp is that it was just open to the surrounding areas. So we didn't have an electric fence around us. Um, it was just up to us to stay in our tents at night when, uh, when the more dangerous animals would be out moving around or when we wouldn't be able to see them coming. And uh, we were told that if we needed to move between our, our meal area or the bar area and the tents at nighttime, that we should just grab a staff person and they could direct us back. And uh, it was interesting because these people were kind of like, you know, big and stocky usually and seemed like they could do a good job of, of keeping you safe, but they weren't really carrying... Um, you know, any weapons or additional protection, and then they would just turn around and walk back towards the central camp. And it's a, a puzzle that I'm still trying to solve, you know, how they would, would feel so comfortable and so at ease just going back and forth out in the open there. So there was the road towards our tent. Sophie, a couple of questions about um, the rhinos that folks are asking. They're wondering if, um, if without the horns, um, can the rhinos still defend themselves? And does that impact their ability to mate? And does it impact their you know, their mating behaviors and, and dominance and all that stuff. Yeah, great questions to go back on the rhinos. And, and I was kind of like slowing and stumbling there because um, I would say um, it's something that's, that's been very carefully thought out and planned with the utmost care by, by conservationists. And so um, the idea in doing it so quickly is that all of the rhinos are losing their horns at the same time so that they're not suffering the consequences of, say, like being that one in the dominance hierarchy who is now without a horn. Uh, I think first and foremost, it's for, um, um, it's more of like a, a secondary sexual characteristic and symbol of dominance, like the size of your horn and whatnot. And so, you know, in the end, if they, if they all lose them at once, you know, I'd imagine that there is an impact, but that horn is typically going to correspond to the health and overall size, or like the horn size will also correspond to the health and size of the rhino, so that, um, you know, if they're all receiving that same treatment, that the thinking is that in the end, um, they're at least equally impacted. So in terms of who's able to breed successfully and, and so on, that it's um, and at least, you know, kind of fair treatment across the board and maybe not having that impact. But... Um, admittedly, it's it's something I'd love to look more into and understand better. I know that it's it's being undertaken, you know, with the thought that ultimately it's it's not ideal for the animals, obviously, uh, to to be removing their horns. But it's better than having that temptation and then not having the animals there at all. And the horns actually do regrow, so uh, you know, it's similar to our fingernails, that same kind of material. And so it's something that has to be done on a certain time scale. I, I'm not totally sure, so it's it's something to maybe look up. And, and research more. But yeah, thanks for that question. So I'll transport you back, and, uh, and I will admit to and say at this point, I know it's, it's been an hour, and if for whatever reason you do need to, uh, to leave this talk kind of on the timeline that it was advertised, uh, you know, please feel free to do so, and, and feel free to reach out with questions or to access this recording that will be available after the fact if you need to see the rest later. But I probably have another 20-ish minutes of stories to share, so hopefully some of you will stick along for the ride. So I'll transport us back into the um, Manuletti Reserve, the second reserve that we visited, and uh, this is where I had this wild experience of being open to the savanna and falling asleep, only to be woken up at maybe 1, 2 in the morning to the sound of bones crunching, and crunching like right outside the wall of the tent, like big, big noises, and then hearing... Um, hearing vocalizations of spotted hyenas out there as well. And it just so happened that I was on the side of the tent that was just a little bit further from where that was concentrated, but my friend Lee, who was sharing the tent with me, was like right there, and it was like there was this thin piece of canvas, this thin fabric that was separating her um, from these big, powerful carnivores um, that are, are really specialized in being able to you know, crunch through bone. They uh, have this incredible jaw strength. And so um, this is some um, hyena scat that, that we didn't find there, but I just wanted to show it because you can see it's pure white. It kind of looks like the Michelin Man. 
uh, because of the bone content. So usually it, um, when it first comes out, it's more of like a brown green color, but then it dries this very white because of all of the calcium and mineral content. And so we'd find this hyena scat in middens in some areas and uh, notice some hyena tracks too. So I just wanted to point out on the screen, hopefully you can see my mouse cursor, uh, but we have a big front and hind foot of a hyena, another front and hind foot, uh, making this kind of zigzagging pattern, which is actually similar to a pattern that uh, raccoons leave in, uh, in North America, if you're familiar with like a front and a hind foot registering one next to the other in pattern. So uh, we definitely, that was from our previous Ingala camp, we were definitely seeing our, our best sign of hyenas there, but just this experience of having them right outside the tent and then here finding the tracks not showing up quite as clearly here, but very obviously hyena tracks right next to the tent was just um, really, really interesting. So Kokomoya Camp was really the, uh, or the Manuelati Game Reserve, um, you know, another private reserve in the greater Kruger area was the spot for big wildlife sightings for us. That's where we kind of um, checked all the animals off our list that we hadn't seen up until that point of the trip. But we also didn't spend as much time on the ground tracking, and so it was, it was definitely a different experience, and obviously each had its benefits. Uh, we got some nice up-close views of zebras, and you can see the ox peckers that are hanging off of their heads, almost like earrings or adornments. So they'd be frequently trailing the zebras, the wildebeest, um, and the, uh, the cape buffalo. On, uh, on some of our wildlife viewing drives in this reserve, we had the experience of getting to go off-road. Uh, there, there are basically a lot more side trails, and I'll play this video, which is the experience of being on one of these trails. And uh, basically needing to kind of like duck under vegetation that was coming in and, and all this, and, and we didn't get to ride in the tracker seats on, on this reserve. There were uh, you know, some of our paid local guides who were doing that, but who knew these animals intimately and knew the spots to bring us right in. And we're all in communication with each other so that we could access things like this site right here. So hopefully this video is coming through okay, but this was the first um, real good like daytime sighting I got of a pride of lionesses and cubs. And we were able to, uh, to sit and watch here as these four lionesses were joined by six cubs, which is what's going to play in this next video. This is sunset time. It's like dusk. The lions are just starting to get active. Our first night on this reserve. And, uh, and some of the cubs had moved away from the lionesses, you know, maybe a bit more energetic and exploratory, and they're now coming back. And maybe one of the most during images and, and my favorite scenes of this trip was just watching the level of physical affection and, and the way of greeting of these cats. You know, they just rub up all over each other, get all their scent on each other. And then this one lioness is coming up for a big stretch. So just, just incredible stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know if this photo even needs me to say anything to it. Just, you know, amazing to see. Uh, lions weren't the only big cat on this reserve. You know, I mentioned um, the experience of being on the ground tracking leopards uh, at the Angala camp, and there are some fantastic experiences that I had getting to see some of these leopards up and on the move. And uh, this is the case of a big male that actually stirred kind of late morning. Like this was the last thing that we did before we went back into breakfast is watch this cat that would quite typically be, be snoozing, be asleep at this time of day and, and more active by night. But this big cat was going from termite mound to termite mound um, on the hunt. And my understanding is that they, they use the elevation of these termite mounds. And I mean, termite mounds are this very common, you know, ever present feature on the landscape. You could call termites a keystone species. Of the bush, of the bushveld for sure, and these um, leopards or this particular leopard was going and climbing, and and from that vantage point, that extra elevation, having this wider view out across the landscape, but then also looking for other animals that had burrowed into these termite mounds. So um, aardvarks are like the number one digger, but then warthogs and a whole series of other animals will also access their burrows. And when we first came across this leopard, he actually seemed to be staking out one of these warthog, warthog burrows and, and may have been a leopard that uh, 
specialized in hunting them, although quite frequently they would go for larger animals like impala and, and some of the other antelope. So absolutely incredible views, but it was also a surreal experience um, just to see the way that people were relating to these animals and just there being such a, a kind of quest and chase to get some of these viewing experiences. And, uh, you know, felt very different than where we'd been for the past week, engaging in a more quiet way on the land. This is a much busier reserve for tourism. And so this is when that leopard first started moving. And in the video here, I felt like I was kind of part of the paparazzi where, you know, three different cars were frantically approaching and all trying to get into position. And there's limits on the number of vehicles that can approach um, any given animal on this reserve and, you know, careful thought that's given to that. Um, but it felt very much like we were on the chase compared to just, you know, being present there and, um, and you know, relating in a different way. Uh, now, granted, these animals were super accustomed to the presence of vehicles. Obviously, this had been something that this leopard had, had known um, to just be part of the baseline of its experience of the landscape for its whole life. And so it was non-reactive to the vehicles there. And so that was, that was the wild thing. So you could definitely make the case that, you know, we're not pushing this animal. This is just part of its regular environment. It's still able to engage in all of its regular behaviors, which are going out and hunting and resting and then walking underneath a vehicle that happens to be there, going between the cars. Um, but just a really interesting thing to notice. Uh, by contrast, I had the experience to get out and, and have more of those quiet moments on this landscape too. It you know, definitely wasn't all just chasing after those big cats and, and obviously those big cats and um, those rare sightings were something that a lot of the tourists there were trying to go for. But there was this one night where we were looking out across a watering hole and saw these two male elephants that had their trunks and tusks kind of locked in a greeting. And to the other side, there was a black-backed black -backed jackal, which was the first one that we'd spotted on the trip. Um, just sniffing at a shrub, you know, I don't know if um, maybe there were some pastings or territorial markings of other animals there, the smell of other jackals or something like that, but this one jackal just completely captivated us, um, almost more than any of the lions or leopards up to that point, and then trotted off into the sunset. And so just, uh, you know, one of those examples of one of those quiet moments of just getting to kind of sit in one place and just have the wildlife come out to you. There were also some lionesses, the same ones that I, I showed a video of approaching um, the day before with all the cubs coming and greeting their mothers. And so this same pride that evening was starting to stir. And uh, there was kind of some energy there and, and we didn't see any big action, but it definitely felt like they were getting ready to go on a hunt that night. And that suspicion was confirmed because the next morning we saw these three vultures um, up in a tree kind of standing as sentinels or announcing uh, the success of the lionesses. And we approached towards that scene to find this big shaggy maned male lion with a belly so full, it looked like he was just totally, um, you know, dozing. And uh, he kind of pulled up his head just to look at us as our vehicle approached and then flopped back down onto the ground um, having been one of the first to, uh, to access the feast of the kill that had been made the night before. And then we came around the corner onto this scene. And uh, I don't think that, I mean, a photo can never do justice to, to actually being in place, obviously, and having the sights, the smells, the sounds uh, of this kind of experience. But again, in contrast to kind of the leopard chase and, and feeling like the paparazzi going after one of these experiences, in this case, our vehicle just slowly crept into the scene. We were the only ones there, and we spent an hour just taking in this lion family, you know, this pride, and then, you know, a couple of associated males um, who were feasting on a Cape buffalo that they had killed the previous night. And this was a, tri or a pride that specialized in taking down buffalo. And what you can see in this image is, uh, well, there's the second of the two male lions that were there. There's little cubs poking up out of the grass. On the upper right, there's a lioness who was pawing in the dirt and probably covering some of the innards or entrails that were leaving scent and attracting some scavengers to the scene. And then the actual kill had been pulled over to the left where that lioness on the left-hand side of the frame is. And we could hear bones crunching again and, and you know, hear the, the tearing flesh as this lion was feeding alongside one of her cubs. 
and uh, jackals, you know, maybe that same one that we saw kind of poking his head in was, uh, was paying attention and there were basically a couple of them in orbit hoping to get in for a share of the spoils and the lionesses and the cubs too were very attuned to these jackals and, and basically actively pushing them off. There is this invisible boundary, you know, wall that if the jackals approach too close, they would get pushed. And uh, they reminded me very much like coyotes in our landscape uh, in North America. And, uh, you know, it even brings back images of, of the ways that coyotes try to access a carcass, say, in, like, Yellowstone and fall lower in the pecking order than wolves or, or grizzlies or a whole host of other animals. And then there is the, the great sport or excitement of watching one of the cubs who is feeding on this buffalo actually getting into the body cavity, it seemed. Like, this cub basically disappeared and uh, this lioness was eating ever so close to where the cub was. This is his little ear. It's like right in the middle. Hopefully you can see my cursor um, moving around there as this lioness is, is digging in. And we were just watching and watching and watching and wondering if he would make it kind of through to the other side. But just, you know, what a wild thing. There's... Um, You know, this is a scale of wildlife viewing that obviously you don't see in North America, not in our eastern forests for sure, but, uh, um, you know, in places like Yellowstone where you have these kinds of sight lines and can see some of these bigger species interacting on the landscape, it's, you know, reminiscent of those kinds of scenes. And, and we were all watching hoping that, uh, that this little lion cub wouldn't get kind of nipped by one of the, or this lioness as she was feeding, and we were assured that he would probably give a little squeal and keep her from... Uh, from getting too close. So there he is successfully out. So those are a couple of stories of, of some of those big um, big moments with, with some of those big wildlife sightings in Kokomoya. And from there, the final part of my South African journey took me a little farther away uh, from Kruger. So we're out of the greater Kruger area and in the Waterberg Biosphere Reserve. And this is, um, we actually journeyed by plane all the way back to Johannesburg, which is down here on the screen, and then, and then rode up to, and to Benny. And this is just a stunningly beautiful landscape that, um, that is actually really rich in rhinos and offered other wildlife viewing opportunities. And one thing that really struck me in this place was just how much more wooded it was. I'm no expert of all the different forest types, but, um, but it was a very treed place, and it actually didn't feel like anything that I really imagined I would encounter in South Africa and in some ways was almost reminiscent of, of Eastern forests, you know, just change the vegetation type and like this almost looks like a scene from Vermont, right? And uh, our, our camp, this is one of the, you know, shelter domes was tucked away in the trees as well. And we would have warthogs making their way through our camp by day and by night. So this is a spot where I had um, probably my most vivid and, and meaningful trailing experience of the whole trip. And what you're looking at here with my, my foot, again, this is really bad tracker etiquette to use your foot or your hand to scale because who knows how big my foot is. But this gives you some rough sense of the size of the tracks that are on the ground here. And this is the front and the hind track of a black rhino that we found one morning. And so we had split off into two different teams and the idea was that we were all gonna go out and try to find fresh rhino trails. This one wasn't particularly fresh. It had been like dewed on and, and it's a little bit aged. Um, but you can see the rhinos moving up the screen. Three toes show up in the track. Um, and, uh, and this is an opportunity to get on this trail. And like any good um, instructive trailing experience, we very quickly went from having perfect rhino tracks showing up in the sand substrate to just going through grassland and losing the trail almost instantly. Um, and one thing I should mention is that a man by the name of Adrian Lowe uh, was visiting us, and he's one of the, um, he's an incredibly skilled tracker, an incredibly skilled trailer, and it was a great honor to be able to trail with him. And I, I think that a lot of us, or you know, at least in the group, we were like wanting to put on our, our best trailing game and be able to accompany him on this journey, and we were just getting completely lost and not able to find this trail. Um, but we actually lost it for about an hour, and we're just wandering through the grass, knowing that there was quite likely a, a black rhino somewhere in this area, and we just weren't able to detect him or her. So here's a fun game. <laughs> you can play the game of can you spot the rhino track 
in this image with me because I think there's at least a couple of footprints that show up in this scene. And uh, here's the, the middle toe of a rhino and side toes showing up here. So every now and then we would end up circling and circling and, and basically going back to our last known track where we had a for sure track like this and then having to um, intuit or, or use our best sense of the landscape to guess at the direction of travel. And in some cases, it, it came down to just noticing some browsed twigs. So we were um, trailing black rhino specifically. There were both black and white rhino on this reserve. And uh, the black rhino is critically endangered, so much lower in number. And it's a browser, so it, it munches woody vegetation compared to the white rhinos. And uh, we just noticed that there were some nipped twigs on, on some of the branches here, and that helped to clue us in to the movement of this black rhino. And um, just such a cool experience to not just be looking for footprints, but just that you know, full view of the landscape and all possible sign to try to detect where it might go. And we eventually ended up finding a very fresh rhino bed and then getting a view. And I don't have a satisfying image at all of the sight of this rhino, uh, but we did manage from about 30 yards away to, to get some binoculars on it and all get a little view. We didn't do a perfect job of, of moving in there quietly. The rhino was definitely aware of our presence, and we all had escape routes, you know, possible trees to climb or, or places to evade in case um, it felt threatened. But, you know, the ultimate goal of, of being out there is wanting to be able to engage in and being on the landscape with these animals, but not have any impact by our presence. So this is a, a silhouette of a white rhino, but it'll stand in place for, for that black rhino that we were able to watch. And then, you know, voices quiet, I'll carefully file back away from and, and leave be on that landscape. Here's an example, um, not of the particular rhino bed that we saw, but this is a white rhino bed. You can see the person's legs just for a scale and just the sheer size of this animal, and even the patterning of its skin, and then some of the tracks that are standing out in this image here. So just incredible spot. And uh, here are some white rhino tracks. If uh, You can ask me later if you want to know how to tell the difference between black rhino and white rhino, or maybe you can tell just by seeing these different images. The only thing that you can really confuse with rhino is, uh, is something like this, which are hippo tracks here. But notice in this case, it's this massive track, bigger than my foot, way bigger than my pen, but with four big toes showing up. And so here was a spot where a hippo um, in a different location had come up out of water at night to feed on grasses on land and had left this great trail on the road. So the last area I'll share is, um, is one of the big surprises at the end of the trip was that we went on a journey up in into the mountains that we'd been looking at for a couple of days in the Waterberg Biosphere Reserve. And uh, it was a road that had a 42% grade that I think took us up the little canyon that you can see on the left there above Erica's head. And uh, up and up and up we went. But rather than finding a mountain drop off on the other side, like this wasn't like going up Mount Mansfield or Camel's Hump or something like that. Um, we actually ended up on this big plateau and it turned out that it wasn't so much a mountain range as this high plateau that and we just had grassland just stretching and stretching away in front of our eyes when we got up to the top. So just uh, so surprising, um, full of different antelope species that we hadn't encountered before, including this eland here, which is the biggest species of antelope in the world. And an ostrich, you know, again, these, these tiny surprises, or not tiny surprises, it was like a huge surprise to look back behind the road on us and notice that an ostrich was approaching and we actually went into our vehicles for cover because we'd been down on the ground looking at elephant and toad tracks. And then we came back down and had, you know, one final night in my, my very last evening in Africa. Um, you know, again, I, I've called a lot of experiences in this talk the most momentous or the most fantastic of the trip, and, and each one of them stands out in different ways. But this was definitely one of the more exciting ones. It happened on our very final evening, and, and I will preface this um, by saying that we had driven up towards this elephant herd, um, this lone herd that was on this um, Entebbeni Reserve, and, and we'd been told, or I'd been informed that the uh, this lone bull elephant was pretty friendly, friendly was the word that was used, and, uh, and we actually paused and we had given a pretty wide berth um, to this elephant, and, and I want to share that because, you know, we weren't trying to pressure these elephants in any way, but uh, that this 
male did decide that he wanted to come and approach us. And, uh, and it marked what for me would be the, the kind of most adrenaline pumping uh, experience of the trip, which was definitely something that I, I realized I was seeking and wanting to be there and engaging with these big animals. And it was finally on this final night. This is a whole other story, but uh, half of our group got charged by lions on a, a different outing in the trip, and I wasn't in that group. So this was my kind of lion charge moment. Um, having this massive elephant approach our vehicle and start nudging the car. Now, I'll pause it there just to say that at this point, um, you know, our, our guides were pros, right? They had, you know, experienced things like this before. Um, Kersey was in the car here, um, you know, seemed pretty calm and confident. Our instruction was to not move, keep our voices low, and, uh, and just, you know, follow instructions, don't stand up, just you know, just wait. And of course, what's going through my head at this point, though, is like, okay, this elephant clearly is coming up and nudging our car. What happens if it knocks it over? Like, we never got the instruction. And, and, uh, and you know, maybe there was never that much of, of that risk anyway, but, uh, but it was definitely a heart-stopping kind of moment to be standing here. And, and I was basically filming this scene and then just like looking with my eyes, wanting to take it in at the same time as a uh, as this elephant approached and, and, you know, I could just look it straight in the eye and, and just, you know, try to, to wonder or fathom what was going on through its mind. And I'm going to go back just to, uh, to play the rest of this video, hopefully, if I can get it to go, because we'd gotten to that point where it approached. And uh, after tapping the car a couple of times, I think um, our guide was revving the engine at this point. You can see the vehicle shake. You know, he's just looking to engage, looking to stand up to us. And I thought it was over here. And he's kind of bluffing now. He's feeding. But he gave this big final approach. And, uh, and it was this intense feeling of relief that passed over me because what happened in the end of that image there was that um, our guide, Lee, was in another vehicle that had approached while this was all happening. And, and Lee's the one who captured this amazing image here of, of this African elephant shaking the dust off. This is kind of like his throwdown challenge is what it felt like or felt like. And Kirstie tells me at this point, she was like, yeah, I think, I think he was pretty much done. Like this was his kind of final dust off and then he was going to be on his way. But uh, but Lee managed to come in and basically came driving up in this other vehicle saying, if you could hear the, the audio of that video, he goes, let's not do that, buddy. And was basically just like issuing that warning or challenge and saying, okay, time to move on. And so it was this kind of intense feeling of relief and being rescued that, that passed over me. Um, but just what a moment. So I know I've probably said that a lot of times and and you know a lot of those what a moment experiences on this trip did have to do with with those big heart pumping wildlife encounters just being on the ground where there are lions and leopards um, you know having that close of an encounter with an elephant just the unpredictability of it but when I look back across this whole trip to South Africa it's also so many of the subtle details that really stand out and I, I think back to the first eagle owl sighting I had and then the subsequent sightings and finding out if you can see in this image here that they have these pink purple eyelids and we saw the same thing in these um, young eagle owlets that we noticed there too and that's you know one of the standout images that comes to mind when I think back on this whole trip you know even more than um, that leopard that stood on the top of a termite mound are also the experience of taking a tiny stalk of grass and reaching it down into the hole that you can see on the ground here which is the lair of a baboon spider and actually feeling the grasp of the spider as it gave a tug back. And it, there was a, a very strong feeling of not being able to pull the grass up and being in relationship with a spider. And I guess they would sense the vibration and grab on. And then I think back to the days where we just sat around the Angala camp where we spent that first week and and uh, watched what Dan Gardoki, our white pine guide, called Ravine TV. And got to just look out and see who was moving or not moving um, through the ravine and just being present to the bird sounds and maybe the vervet monkeys trying to come through and jump through the wires to access our trash bin. And then just the you know, expansive scenery. This is the view back towards the Waterberg Mountains from the backside. And uh, 
we had this awesome sit spot. And if, if you're not somebody, I know North Branch has been doing a good job of promoting the, the practice of sit spots and sitting out in nature during these quarantine times that we're experiencing now. And uh, you certainly don't need to go to as spectacular a place as this to see some really fantastic things. Because we sat up on these cliffs for about 20 minutes one evening around sunset. And uh, the scenery was beautiful, but what really stood out was just that in sitting quietly there for 20 minutes, we had the most wonderful encounters with some small wildlife. And hopefully this video is playing properly and not too choppily for all of you. This was taken by my friend Amy Beal from White Pine. She's uh, another one of the current teachers of the White Pine Tracking Apprenticeship. And she got this footage of an elephant true. And notice just that nose going. It's a funny thing being on this online format. It's like I'm just, you know, imagining or at least what would be going on in my kind of audience mindset would be, ah, oh, and look how cute it is or something like that. But of course, I get no feedback. Um, but just, you know, wild and wonderful animal. And like maybe before this trip, I'd heard the name Elephant Shrew, but hadn't had the chance to, to encounter one. And we all walked away from that experience um, you know, similarly to sitting out and just watching the black-backed jackal on the land at the Manuletti Reserve, just being in love with some of the smaller wildlife and, uh, and just the kind of unexpected surprises that you get from just being out and present on the land for that amount of time. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, I would encourage you to, to go out and experience in your own backyards, too. It's, it's been a fun adventure to be able to travel back to Africa, and I hope you've enjoyed all the images from, from that trip all those years ago. Maybe you're, you're feeling inspired for um, some travels of your own. But here's an image from just the, the little park next to my house in Seattle now from yesterday or two days ago. And I was out sitting on a bench for 20 minutes when I finally looked down and expanded my awareness and realized that I had this awesome tracking substrate that I kind of discounted because it was full of dog tracks, like you can see up at the top of the frame there, and, uh, and not much else. And then realized that there is this wild pattern of lines all over the ground in the early morning. It's like something had moved through in the wee hours and uh, this wildly changing pattern. And, uh, and figured out upon closer inspection that there were a whole bunch of dried up earthworms lying on the ground there, and, uh, and they must have been the levers of these wild trails. And then even in downtown Seattle, true to form, I'm using my house key as a scale item here, but these are otter tracks that I found. Um, next to this fairly busy spot, there's these locks called the Ballard Locks in Seattle. And, uh, and I was just down there at low tide one night and noticed that there was an otter trail at the high tide line. And, and you know, this is in a, a busy urban center, the biggest urban center in Washington state. And, uh, and here are the signs of this wildlife just ready for me to be noticing if I, if I choose to go and look. So with that, um, you know, I want to send out a, a lot of love and acknowledgement to everybody who supported me on, on this trip to South Africa. There were a lot of friends and family who helped um, in many ways, emotionally and financially, to make it possible. And then, of course, this amazing crew of 17 travelers that I got to go on adventure with. Um, and I will say that, you know, it's amazing to go out for sit spots, and there's so much that can be found just by, by paying attention and being out there solo. But the one hard thing, I would say, of these quarantine times or, or social distancing times is not being able to get out in groups and, and benefit from the multiple eyes, ears, you know, curiosities of a group of trackers. And I just, you know, can't recommend highly enough, uh, you know, the benefit of just getting out in the woods and, and opening your senses and going out without an agenda and, uh, and looking for some of these wildlife signs whether in far from places like Africa or just in your backyards in Vermont or wherever you're listening from. So, um, you know, thank you again so much. I am happy to stick around for questions. Thanks to all who, who listened in as I classically went way beyond the hour that I had planned for this talk. And uh, I will just mention as, as a last note, and I'll leave this info up on the screen as, as we chat some more, but if you're interested in going on a trip like this, um, if, if the wildlife tracking approach is the approach for you, Dan Hanchi, uh, who is one of our, our White Pine leaders who initiated this, is offering a very similar trip in partnership with Kersey and Lee in July 2021. So you can find details about that at spurwander.com. I know that North Branch Nature Center is also uh, making a trip to South Africa around that same time, actually, right next summer. And, uh, and so I think there's a couple of spots that are still left in that trip. Last I heard from Sean, he can update me if that's incorrect. And then um, Kersey and Lee through Original Wisdom and NatureGuideTraining.com is actually Lee Gutteridge's organization. 
Um, you can find out more about their programs that they're running. Uh, they bring a lot of groups from North America to South Africa and, and to other Southern African countries. Uh, so definitely worth checking out some of those opportunities and what they're up to. And then lastly, if you're interested in helping to support some of the anti-poaching efforts, including the, the rhino dehorning and other measures in the Balulay Nature Reserve, uh, I have a link to my website down there. And uh, on that page, I've, uh, I've posted some information about some uh, financial details if, if you're interested in contributing some financial support. Understanding that, of course, that could be well out of reach for people, and, and this is kind of an interesting financial time. But if you are in the way to be able to contribute and, and want to have a, a strong impact on this local spot that I was talking about, that there's information about how to do that there. So thanks so much, all, for listening. Thank you, Sophie. Much appreciated. Um, I'll, I will uh, jump in and, and agree that uh, North Branch Nature Center does actually have a South Africa trip coming up way in September of 2021. And I think we have one, maybe two spaces left on it. So um, if so, if the Spur Wander uh, trip that's up on the screen right now fills up, just, just know that there's a space with your name on it uh, with, with the Nature Center. Um, maybe I can even rope Sophie into joining us on that trip. Who knows? Um, there's a couple of uh, quick questions, Sophie. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody was asking uh, what you were using to capture these photos, if you were just using a phone or if you had a camera or, uh, or what you're doing there. Yeah, great question. So um, I, have, I have pretty simple photography equipment. So some of those images were captured on my phone, um, which is at the time was like a Samsung S7 or Samsung Galaxy smartphone. Um, which, you know, did the trick. Um, and then everything else was just on a kind of advanced compact camera. It was like a Canon, oh, I'm going to forget the number, but it's basically um, an advanced compact Canon camera. And if, if you're interested, I can follow up specifically on the type, but basically non-SLR. So um, I did intersperse a couple of photos from my friend Matt Dickinson, who had much nicer camera equipment. Uh, Lee Gutteridge's image of the, you know, the elephant with all the dust shaking off of it was, you know, taken on, again, some, some nicer equipment that has an ability to capture more light. So I, I've always verged on the side of not wanting to be encumbered by having to carry multiple lenses and that sort of thing. And, and I think I'm going to very quickly graduate out of that position in, in the coming months or years. But, you know, at the moment, um, yeah, it's my Canon PowerShot camera that I carry around. And it, the feature that I love on it, again, you know, it doesn't collect as much light or, or get quite, quite as crisp an image quality, but it does have something like a 50 time uh, optical zoom on it. So that was really a key feature for, for being able to capture some of these African animals. Does anybody else have any questions they want to ask before we let Sophie go? Well, Sophie, you should make sure to read the chat bar here because there's a lot of love coming from a lot of folks that you've worked with over the years here. Um, cool. Well, sounds so good. Um, yeah, thanks all so much for, for coming in and listening. It, it feels like a complete, um, you know, treat to be able to share, and, and hopefully you're walking away with a bit of inspiration or, or excitement from having shared in some of this. I, uh, I wish that I could have just, like, all taken you and, like, imparted all of the knowledge of that trip and, like, there's just so much more to learn about this place as there is about, you know, every place that it's possible to visit. So, uh, so hopefully I accomplished my goal of just kind of giving you that, that taste of it and, and what it felt like to be there, which has been a fun thing for me to get to share. I think one of the really important things about any sort of, uh, of nature travel is it's almost an obligation to take that back home and share it the best you can with the people around you in your community. So, um, so Sophie, thank you for, for um, bringing it to our community and for sharing your stories with us. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation, Sean, and for um, putting on all these events with North Branch. It's been great. great. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.